Hello, I'm Deathseeker512, and in today's video, I will be um, reading a book called Java Notes. So this is a programming tutorial kind of book, or about the Java language. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this because there's a lot of like newbie people who uh, want to learn Java and then they crack open a PDF file or a book and they're like, uh, I don't want to learn this anymore just because of the amount of reading. So I figured, hey, what if I grabbed one and started reading it to, well, you guys actually. So that's what I've decided to do. Also, this is going to be the only video uh, that has this like intro uh, and the rest of the videos as you can probably guess is just also going to be black like this. So without further ado, what I have planned to do for every time I read, I am only going to be oh what is it, um, 10 pages and then if there is still more uh, till the end of the that particular section, then I will keep reading until that end. So the uh, minimum I will be reading is 10 pages and then it's whatever else is left of that section that way you know Hey look I'm stopping in the middle of a sentence. No that that won't be happening It'll be at the end of the section and so I'm not also stopping in the middle of a section So I know I said this a second ago, but I really mean it now without further ado here I go also the link to this book will be in the description uh there is a web version a book version i believe and also a pdf version and i will be reading the pdf version which has been updated with minor changes uh may 2003 uh the uh, the first page has introduction to programming using java and the version is 6.0 june 2011 again version 6.02 with minor corrections in may 2013 now this book is has been made by David J. Ecke, CK, and from uh, Albert and William Smith Colleges. Uh, the PDF version, well, sorry, this is the, the location of the online version is uh, math.hws.edu forward slash java notes forward slash. And yeah, it has been copyrighted from 1996. 2013 from when I started reading this and might have changed if you know you're watching this at a much later date and the, it's uh, the Department of Mathematics and Computer Education up to the pretty much the licenses the Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial shared alike 3.0 license you can view the license at creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash nc dash sa forward slash 3.0 forward slash um so there are a total of 13 chapters okay so i will be starting at the preface and if you have the books the the actual book and not just the this it will be on uh page x or you know 10 uh well also you won't really be hearing too many like breaks because I can just edit it because I'm recording everything in Audacity if you're wondering. Uh, but yeah, so the preface. Uh, well, actually, no. Okay, so I'm just going to read through uh, all the chapter names. That way you kind of know what's in each of the chapters. That way, hey, that way if you can say, hey, I don't really need to learn all of these. So the first one is called The Mental Landscape, and it talks about how a computer really works. Uh, the names of things is about variables and input-output and subroutines as well well as expressions and the programming environment. Control, so that's like blocks, loops, branches, algorithms, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, for while switch statement. Oh, and if statement. Uh, then four is subroutine, so, you know, subroutine. Five is object classes, so it's a little bit of uh, programming with a object-oriented programming language, such as Java. Yeah, six is the introduction to GUI, so graphical user interfaces, so like a window. Uh, the web browser you're using is a GUI, for instance. I, I, I used to say GUI all the time, it ticked me off when people always said GUI, but now I'm saying it. Yay! Seven's about arrays, so what you can use arrays for. Uh, eight is correctness, robustness, and efficiency. So, uh, linked data structures and recursion, I guess kind of self-explanatory. Uh, generic programming and collection classes. So, eleven is streams, files, and networking. So, well, honestly, that last one, networking. So, uh, client server connections and so on. Uh, threads and multiprocess. Self-explanatory, I guess. Uh, advanced GUI programming. Touching back on the GUI, uh, so like action buttons, complex components, and so on. And well, those are all of the facets. All, all, uh, all the chapters. My bad. Anyways, uh, so 
All of that won't be included in the 10 pages. However, starting from the preface, it will. So I'm on page 12 on the PDF file. So, preface. Introduction to Programming Using Java is a free introductory, introductory computer programming textbook that uses Java as the language of instruction. It is suitable for an introductory programming course and for people who are trying to learn programming on their own. There is There are no <laughs> prerequisites beyond a general familiarity with ideas of computers and programs. There is enough material for a full year of college level programming. Chapters 1 through 7 can be used as a textbook in a one semester college level course or in a year long high school course. The remaining chapters can be covered in a second course. The sixth edition of the book covers Java 5.0 along with a few features that were introduced in Java 6 and 7. While Java 5.0 introduced major new features that were needed to be covered in introductory programming course, Java 6 and 7 did not. Whenever the text covers a feature that was not present in Java 5.0, that fact is explicitly noted. Note that the Java applets appear throughout the pages of the online version in this book. Most of the applets require Java 5.0 or higher. The home website for this book is http colon forward slash forward slash math dot hws edu forward slash java notes forward slash. The page at the address contains links for downloading a copy of the website and for the downloading PDF versions of the book. In style, this is a textbook rather than a tutorial. That is, it is it concentrates on explaining concepts rather than giving step-by-step how-to-do-it guides. I have tried as a com converse, conversational writing style that might be closer to classroom lecture than a typical textbook. Uh, you'll find programming exercises at the end of each chapter, except for chapter one. For each exercise, there is a web page that gives detailed solutions for that exercise. Uh, with the sort of discussion that I would give if I presented the solution in class. Solutions to the exercises can be found only in the web versions of the textbook. I strongly advise that you read the exercise solution if you want the most out of this book. Uh, also, note, I'm um, sorry if I skipped a line or something because I had to like, grab a charger. This is certainly not a Java reference book and it is not a comprehensive survey of all the features of Java. It is not written as a quick introduction to Java for people who already know another programming language. Instead, it is directed mainly towards people who are learning programming for the first time, and it is as much about general programming concepts as it is about Java in particular. I believe that introduction to programming using Java is fully competitive with conventional published printed programming textbooks that are available on the market. Well, all right, I'll Confess that I think it's better. There are several approaches to teaching Java. One approach is using graphical user interface programming from the very beginning. Some people believe that uh, object-oriented programming should also be emphasized from the very beginning. That is not the approach I take. The approach I favor starts with the more basic building blocks of programming and build and builds from there. After an introductory chapter, I uh, cover procedural programming in chapters two, three, and four. Object-oriented programming is introduced in chapter 5, chapter 6, and covers the closely related topic of event-oriented programming and graphical user interface. Arrays are covered in chapter 7, chapter 8 is a short chapter that marks a turning point in the book, moving beyond the fundamental ideas of programming to cover more advanced topics. Chapter 8 is written about robust, correct, uh, correct and efficient programming. Chapters 9 and 10 cover recursion and data structures, including the Java Collection framework. Chapter Chapter 11 is about files and networking. Chapter 12 covers threads and parallel processing. Finally, Chapter 13 recovers, uh, sorry, returns to the topics of graphical user interface programming to cover some of Java's more advanced capabilities. Major changes were made from the previous fifth edition of this book. Perhaps the most significant change was the use of parametrized types in the chapter on the generic program. Parametrized types in Java's, uh, Java's version of templates were the most eagerly anticipated new feature in Java 5.0. Other new features in Java 5.0 were also introduced in the 5th edition, including enumerated types, formatting output, and scanner class, and, sorry, the scanner class, and variable arity methods. Wow, I don't know why it's so 
slow it down in there. In addition, Javadoc comments were covered for the fifth time. For the first time, the changes in the six editions are much smaller. The major changes is a new chapter on threads, chapter 12. Material about threads from previous edition has been moved to this chapter, and a good deal of new material has been added. Other changes include some coverage of features added to Java in version 6 and 7, and the inclusion of a glossary. There are also smaller changes throughout the book. The latest complete edition of Introductory to Java Programming using Java, wow, Introduction to Prov to programming using Java is always available online at http colon forward slash forward slash math dot hws dot edu forward slash java notes forward slash the first version of the book was written in 1996 and there have been several editions since then all editions are achieved at the following web addresses first edition uh, math.hws.edu forward slash ECK forward slash CS124 forward slash Java Notes 1 forward slash and then the only change from the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth editions are actually just instead of one on Java Notes 1, it would be Java Notes 2, Java Notes 3, Java Notes 4, Java Notes 5, and Java Notes 6. And of course, Java Notes 1 covers Java 1.0. Java Notes 2 covers Java 1.1, Java Notes 3 covers Java 1.1 as well, uh, the 4th edition covers Java 1.4, the 5th edition covers Java 5.0, and the 6th edition covers Java 5.0 and later. Introduction to Java, uh, Introduction to Programming using Java is free, but it is not in the public domain. As of version 6.0, it is published under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 3.0 license. To view a copy of this license, visit http colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash nc dash sa forward slash 3.0 forward slash. For example, you can post an unmodified copy of the online version on your own website, including the parts that list the author and state in the license under which it is distributed. Give away unmodified copies uh, of this book or sell them at a cost of production as long as they meet the requirements of the license. Make modified copies of the complete book or parts of it and post them on the web or otherwise distribute them non-commercially provided that attribution is, uh, sorry, to the author is given, the modifications are clearly noted and the modified copies are distributed under the same license as the original. This includes translations to other languages. For use of the book in ways not covered by the license, permissions of the author is required. Questions again, sorry. While it is not actually required by the license, I do appreciate hearing from people who are using or distributing my work. A technical note on production. The online and PDF versions of this book are created from a single source, which is written largely in XML. To produce the PDF version, the XML is processed into a form that can be used by the text typesetting program. In addition, XML, uh, sorry, in addition to XML, text macro file, sorry, files. The source includes DTS and XSLT transformations. Java source code files, image files, uh, text macro file, and a couple of scripts that are used in processing. I have made the complete source files available to download, download at the following address http forward at colon forward slash forward slash math.hws.edu.ec, uh, sorry, not dot, but forward slash ECK forward slash CS124 forward slash downloads forward slash Java Notes 6 dash full dash source dot zip. These files were not originally meant for publication and therefore are not very cleanly written. Furthermore, it requires a fair amount of expertise to use them effectively. However, I have had several requests for the sources and have made them available on an as-is basis. For more th information about the source and how they sh are used, see the readme file from the source download. Professor David J. Eck, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Hobart, that's our Hobart and William Smith Colleges, 300 Putney Street, uh, Geneva, New York, 14456, uh, USA. Email, 
ezk at hws.edu. Uh, www. World Wide Website is http colon forward slash forward slash math dot hws dot edu dot no, sorry. Again, add a dot a forward slash ECK. Chapter 1. Now I'm starting to think that this 10 pages thing might be a little long, but then again, it would be 75 and whatever. When you begin a sorry, uh, overview. The mental landscape. When you begin a journey, it is a good idea to have a mental map of the terrain you'll be passing through. The same is true for the in intellectual journey, such as learning to write computer programs. In this case, you'll need to know the basics of what computers are and how they work. You'll want to have some idea of what a computer program is and how one is created, since you will be writing programs in the Java programming language. You'll want to know something about that language in particular and about the modern network computing environment for which Java is designed. As you read this chapter, don't worry if you can't understand everything in detail. In fact, it'd be impossible for you to learn all the details from the brief exposition in the chapter. Concentrate on learning enough about the big ideas to orient, orient yourself in preparation for the rest of the book. Most of what is covered in this chapter will be covered in much greater detail later in the book. 1.1. The Fetch and Execute Cycle. Machine language. A computer is a complex system consisting of many different components, but at the heart of the brain, or if you want the computer, is a single uh, component that does the actual computing. This is the central processing unit, or CPU. In modern desktop computers, the CPU is a single chip on the order of one square inch in size. The job of the CPU is to execute programs. A program is simply a list of ambiguous instructions meant to be followed mechanically by a computer. A computer is built to carry out instructions that are written in a very simple type of language called machine language. Each type of computer has its own machine language and the computer will, can directly execute a program only if the program is expressed in that language. It can execute programs written in other languages if they are first translated into machine language. When the CPU executes a program, that program is stored in the computer's main memory, also called RAM, or ran uh, sorry, random access memory. In addition for, to the program, memory can also hold data that is being used or processed by the program. Main memory consists of a sequence of locations. These locations are numbered and the sequence number of locations is called address. An address provides a way of picking out one particular piece of information from among millions of stored mem in memory. When the CPU needs to access a program, instruction, or data in a particular location, it sends the address of that information as a signal to the memory. The memory responds by sending back the data contained in the specified location. The CPU can also store information in memory by specifying the information to be uh, yeah, to be stored and the address of the location where it is to be stored. On the level of machine language, the operation of the CPU is fairly straightforward, although it is very complicated in detail. The CPU ex executes a program that is stored as a sequence of machine language instructions in the main memory. It does not. Uh, sorry, it does this by repeatedly reading or fetching an instruction from memory and then carrying out or executing that instruction. This pro process, fetch an instruction, execute, fetch another instruction, execute, and also uh, and so on forever. It is called the fetch and execute cycle, with one exception, which will be covered in the next section. This is all about the C This is all about the CPU ever does. The details of the section execute cycle are not terribly important, but there are a few basic things you should know. The CPU contains a few internal registers, which are small memory units capable of holding a single number or machine language instruction. The CPU uses one of these registers, a program counter or PC, to keep track of where it is in the program it is executed. The PC stores the address of the next instruction that the CPU should execute at the beginning of each fetch and execute cycle. The CPU checks the PC to see which instructions it should fetch. During this course of the fetch and, uh, the fetch and execute cycle, 
The number in the PC is updated to indicate the instruction that is to be executed in the next cycle. Usually, but not always, this is the instruction that sequentially follows the current instruction in the program. A computer executes machine language programs mechanically, that is, without understanding them or thinking about them, simply because of the way it is physically put together. This is not an easy concept. A computer is a machine built on a built of millions of tiny switches called transistors, which have the property that they can be fired together in such a way that an output from one switch can turn another switch off or on. As a computer computes, these switches turn each other. As computer computes, these switches turn each other on or off in a pattern determined by uh, both by the way they are wired together and by the program that the computer is executing. Machine language instructions are expressed as binary numbers. A binary number is made up of just two possible digits, zero and one. So a machine language instruction is just a sequence of, sequence of zero and one, uh, on and off, pretty much. Each particular sequence encodes some particular the data that the computer manipulates is also encoded as binary numbers. A computer can work directly with binary numbers because switches can readily represent such numbers. To turn a switch on in memory as a pattern of switches uh, to represent a 1, turn it off to represent Okay. Turn the switch on to represent a 1, turn it off to represent a 0. Machine language instructions are stored in memory as patterns of switches turned on or off. When a machine language instruction is loaded into CPU, all that happens is that a certain switch is or turn on or off in the pattern that encodes a particular instruction. The CPU is built to respond to this pattern by executing the instruction it encodes. It does not it does this simply because of the way all other switches in the CPU are wired together. So you should understand this much about how computers work. Main memory holds machine language programs and data. These are encoded as binary numbers. The CPU fetches the machine language instructions from memory one after another and executes them. It does this mechanically without thinking about or understanding what it does, and therefore the program it executes must be perfect, complete in all details, and unambiguous because the CPU can do nothing but execute it exactly as it is written. Here is a schematic view of this first stage understanding of the computer. 1.2 Asynchronous events pulling, loops, and interrupts. The CPU spends almost all of its time fetching instructions from the memory and executing them. However, the CPU and main memory are the are only two out of many components in a real computer system. A complete system contains other devices such as a hard disk for storing programs and data files. Note that the main memory holds only a comparatively small amount of information and holds it only as long as the power is turned on. A hard disk is used for permanent storage of larger amounts of information, but programs have to be loaded from the disk into the main memory before they can actually be executed. A keyboard and mouse for user input, a monitor and printer, which can be used to display the computer's output. So like in the very old computers, they actually didn't have a monitor, it was just a printer. So that's how they got all their data, was printing everything. An audio and output device that allows the computer to play sounds. A network interface that allows the computer to communicate with other computers that are connected to it on the network, either wirelessly or by wire, obviously. <laughs> A scanner that converts images into coded binary numbers that can be stored into manipulated, uh, sorry, stored and manipulated on the computer. The list of devices is entirely open-ended, and computer systems are built so that they can easily expand, be expanded by adding new devices. Somehow, the CPU has to communicate with and control all of these devices. The CPU can only do this by executing machine language instructions, which is all it can do, period. The way this works is that for each device in a system, there is a device driver, which consists of software that the CPU executes when it has to deal with the device. Installing a new software device on a system generally has two steps, plugging in the device physically into the computer and installing the device driver software. 
Without the device driver, the active physical device would be useless since the CPU would not be able to communicate with it. A uh, computer system consists of many devices that typically organize by connecting those devices into one or more buses. A bus is a set of wires that carry various sorts of information between devices connected to those wires. The wires carry data addresses and control signals and address directed data to a particular device and perhaps to a particular register or location within that device. Control signals can be used, for example, by one device to alert another that data is available for it in, on the data bus. A fairly simple computer program might be organized like this. Now, devices such as keyboards, mouse, and network interface can produce inputs that need to be processed by the CPU. How does the CPU know that the data is there? One simple idea, which turns out not to be the very satisfactory, is for the CPU to keep checking for incoming data over and over. Whenever it finds data, it processes. This method is called hold. Since the CPU holds the input devices continually to see whether they have any input data to report. Unfortunately, although pulling is very simple, it is also very inefficient. The CPU can waste an awful lot of time just waiting for input. To avoid this in, uh, inefficiency, interrupts are often used instead of pulling. An interrupt is a signal sent by another device to the CPU. The CPU responds to interrupt an interrupt signal by putting aside whatever it is doing in order to respond to the interrupt. Once it has handled the interrupt, it returns to what it was doing before the interrupt occurred. For example, when you press a key on your, on your keyboard, a uh, keyboard interrupt is sent to the CPU. The CPU then responds to signal interruption that what it is doing, reading the keys that you press, processing, processing it, and then returning to the task it was performing before you press the key. Again, you should understand that this is purely a, uh, sorry, this is a purely mechanical process. A device signals an interrupt simply by turning on a wire. The CPU is built so that when the wire is turned on, the CPU saves enough information about what it's currently doing so that it can return to the same state later. This information consists of the contents of important internal registers and such as the program counter. The, then the CPU jumps to some predetermined memory location and begins executing the instructions stored there. Those instructions are make up of an interrupt handler that then does the process necessary to respond to the interrupt. This interrupt handler is part of the device driver software for the device that signals the interrupt. At the end of the interrupt handler is an instruction that tells the CPU to jump back to what it was doing. It does that by restoring its previously saved state. Interrupts allow the CPU to deal with asynchronous events and the regular fetch and execute type so things happen in a predetermined order. Everything that happens is synchronized with everything else. Interrupts make it possible for the CPU to deal efficiently with events that happen asynchronously. That is, at unpredictable times. Wow, that, that's no way. Anyway, another example of how interrupts are used, consider what happens when the CPU needs to access data that is stored on the hard disk. The CPU can access data directly only if it is in main memory. Data on the disk has to be copied into memory before it can be accessed. Unfortunately, on the scale of speed at which the CPU operates, the disk drive is extremely slow. When the CPU needs data from the disk, it sends a signal to the disk drive telling it to locate the data and get it ready. The signal is sent synchronously under the control of, the reg of a regular program. Then, instead of just waiting the long, unpredictable amount of time that the disk drive will take to do this, the CPU goes on with some other task. When the disk drive has that ready, it sends an interrupt signal to the CPU. The interrupt handler can then read the requested data. Now, you might have noticed that all this only makes sense if 
the CPU actually has several tasks to perform. It has nothing but if it has nothing better to do, it might as well spend its time pulling for input or waiting for disk drive operations to complete. All modern computers use multitasking to perform several tasks at once. Some computers can be used by several people at once. Since the CPU is so fast, it can quickly switch its attention from one user to another, devoting a fraction of a second to each user in turn. This application of multitasking is called time sharing. But a modern personal computer with just a single user also uses multitasking. For example, the user might have to be typing a paper while a clock is continuously displaying the time and a file is being downloaded over the network. Each of the individual tasks that the CPU is working on is called a thread or a process. There are technical differences between threads and processes, but they're not important here since this is not since it is threads that are used in Java. Many CPUs can literally execute more than one thread simultaneously, such as CPUs contain multiple cores, each of which can run a thread, but it's sent, uh, but there's always a limit on the number of threads that can be executed at the same time. Since there are often more threads than can be executed simultaneously, the computer has to be able to switch its attention from one thread to another, just as a time sharing computer switches its attention from one user to another. In general, a thread that is being executed will continue to run until one of several things happens. The thread might voluntarily yield control to give over sorry, to give other threads a chance to run. The thread might have to wait for some asynchronous event to occur. For example, the thread might request some data from the disk drive, or it might wait for the user to press a key. While it is waiting, the thread is said to be blocked and other threads, if any, have the chance to run. When the events occur, the interrupts will wake up the thread so that it can continue running. The thread might use up its allotted slice of time and be suspended to allow other threads to run. Not all computers can forcibly suspend a thread in this way. Those that can are said to be used as preemptive multitasking. To do preemptive multitasking, a computer needs to sorry, needs a special timer device that generates an interrupt at a regular interval, such as 100 times per second. When a timer timer interrupts interrupt occurs, the CPU has a chance to switch from one thread to another, whether the thread that is currently running likes it or not. All modern desktop and laptop computers use preemptive multitasking. Ordinary users and indeed ordinary programmers have no need to deal with interrupts and interrupt handlers. They can con they, they can concentrate on different tasks or threads that they want the computer to perform. The details of how the computer manages to get all of those tasks done are not important to them. In fact, most users and many programmers can ignore threads and multitasking altogether. However, threads have become increasingly important as computers have become more powerful and as they need and as they have begun to make more use of multitasking and multiprocessing. In fact, the ability to work with threads is as fast it is fast becoming an essential job skill for programmers. Fortunately, Java has a good support for threads which are built into the Java programming language as a fundamental programming concept. The, pro uh, the programming with threads will be covered in chapter 12. Just as important uh, in Java and modern programming in general is the basic concept of asynchronous events. While programmers don't actually deal with interrupts directly, they do often find themselves writing event handlers which, like interrupt handlers, are called asynchronous, asynchronously when specific events occur, such as event driven programming. It's very different feel from as a very different feel from the more traditional straight straight through synchronous program. We will begin with the more traditional type of program, which is still used for programming individual individual tasks. But we will learn that we will return to thread and events later in the text, starting in chapter six. By the way, the software that does all the interrupt handling handles communication with the user and the hardware devices and controls which thread is allowed to run it is called the operating system. The operating system is the basic essential software without which a computer would not be able to function. Other programs such as word processors and worldwide web browsers are dependent upon operating systems. 
common operating system simple with Linux, Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Mac OS. 1.3 Machine language consists of very simple instructions that can be executed directly by the CPU of a computer. Almost all programs, though, are written in high-level programming languages such as Java, Pascal, or C++. A program written in a high-level language cannot be run directly on any computer. First, it has to be translated into machine language. This translation can be done through a program called a compiler. A compiler takes a high-level language program and translates it into an executable machine language program. Once the translation program and translates it into an executable machine language program, once the translation is done, the, uh, the machine language program can run any number of times, but of course, it can only be run on one type of computer. Since each type of computer has its own individual machine language, if the program is to run on another type of computer, it has to be retranslated using di a different compiler into the appropriate machine language. There is an alternative to compiling high-level language program. Instead of using a compiler which translates the program all at once, you can use an eruptor which translates its instruction by instruction as necessary. An eruptor is a program that acts much like a CPU with a kind of fetch and execute cycle. In order to execute a program, the interrupter runs a loop in which it repeatedly reads one instruction from the program, decides what is necessary to carry out the instruction, and then performs the appropriate machine language commands to do so. One use of interrupters is to execute high-level language programs. For example, the programming language Lisp is usually executed by interrupter rather than a compiler. However, interrupters have another purpose. They can let you use a machine language program meant for one type of computer on a completely different type of computer. For example, there is a program called Virtual PC that runs on Mac OS computers. Virtual PC is an interrupter that executes machine language programs written on, uh, for IBM PC Clump computers. If you run Virtual PC on your Mac OS, you can run any PC program, including programs written for Windows, unfortunately a PC program will be much more slowly than it would on an actual IBM clone. The problem is that Virtual PC executes several macOS machine language instructions for each PC machine language instruction in the program it is interrupting. Compiling programs are inherently faster than interrupted programs. The designers of Java chose to use a combination of Compilation and interruption. Programs written in Java are compiled to a machine language, but it is a machine language for a computer that doesn't really exist. This so-called virtual computer is known as the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM. The machine language for the Java Virtual Machine is called Java Bytecode. There is no reason why Java Bytecode couldn't be used as the machine language of a real computer rather than a virtual computer. But the fact is, but in fact, use of a virtual machine makes uh, possible makes possible one of the main selling points of Java. The fact that it can actually be used on any computer. All that the computer needs is an is an interpreter. I may have said interrupter, but I meant interpreter. Now that I think about it, computer uh, makes uh, the fact that it can use be actually be used on any computer. All that the computer needs is interrupt an interpreter for Java bytecode, such as. Interpret such an interpreter simulates the JVM in the same way that the virtual PC simulates a PC computer. The term JVM is also used for the Java bytecode interpreter program that does the simulation. So we say that a computer needs a JVM in order to run Java programs. Technically, it would be more correct to say that an interpreter implements the JVM in the state it is. JVM. Of course, a different Java bytecode interpreter is needed for each type of computer, but once in, but once a computer has a Java bytecode interpreter, it can run any Java bytecode program. And the same Java bytecode program can be run on any computer that has such an interpreter. This is one essential feature, but one of the essential features of Java. The same compiled program can be run on many 
different types of computers. Well, you might wonder, use the intermediate Java bytecode at all. Why not just distribute the original Java program and let each person compile it into the machine language of whatever computer they want to run it on? There are many reasons. First of all, a compiler has to understand Java, a complex high-level language. The compiler itself is a complex program. A Java bytecode interpreter, on the other hand, has a fairly small simple program. This makes it easy to write a bytecode interpreter for a new type of computer. Once that is done, the computer can run on any compiled Java program. It would be much harder to write a Java compiler for the same computer. Furthermore, many Java programs are meant to be downloaded over a network. This leads to obvious security concerns. You don't want to download and run a program that will damage your computer or your files. The bytecode interpreter acts as a buffer between you and the program you download. You are really running the interpreter, which runs the downloaded program indirectly. The interpreter can protect you from potentially dangerous actions on part of the program. When Java was still a new language, it was criticized for being slow. Since Java bytecode was executed by an interpreter, it seemed that Java bytecode programs could never run as quickly as programs compiled into the native machine language. This is the actual machine language of the computer on which the program is running. However, this problem has largely over been, uh, has been largely overcome by the use of the just-in-time compilers for executing Java bytecode. A just-in-time compiler translates Java bytecode into native machine language. It does this while it is executing the program, just as for a normal interpreter. The input to a just-in-time compiler is a Java bytecode program, and its task to execute that program. No, and its task is to execute that program. But as it is executing the program, it also translates part of it into machine language. The translated parts of the program can then be executed much more quickly than they could be interpreted. Since a given part of a program is often executed many times as the program runs a just-in-time compiler, it can significantly speed up all overall execution. I should note that there is no necessary connection between Java and Java bytecode. A program written in Java could certainly be compiled into machine language of a real computer, and programs written in other language could be compiled into Java bytecode. However, it is the combination of Java and Java bytecode that is platform independent, secure, and network compatible while allowing you to program in modern high-level object-oriented language. In the past few years, it has become fairly common to create new programming languages or versions of old languages that compile into Java bytecode. The compiled bytecode programs can then be executed by standard JVM. The new languages that have been developed specifically for programming the JVM include Ruby, uh, Clojure, and Process. Jython and JRuby are versions of older languages Python and Ruby that target the JVM. These languages make it possible to enjoy many of the advantages of the JVM while avoiding some of the technicalities of, Java language, of the Java language. In fact, the use of other languages with the JVM has become important enough that several new features have been added to the JVM. In Java version 7, specifically to add better support for some of those languages. I should also note that the really hard part of the platform independent programming is a graphical user interface with Windows buttons, etc. That will work in all the platforms that uh, support Java. You'll see more about this problem in section 126. There are two basic aspects of programming, data and instructions. To work with data, you need to understand variables and types to work with instructions. You need to understand control structures and subroutines. You'll spend a large part of the course becoming familiar with these concepts. A variable is just the memory location, or several locations treated as a unit, that has been given a name so that it can be easily referred to and used in a program. The programmer only has to worry about the name. It is the, it is the compiler's responsibility to keep track of the memory location. The programmer does not sorry, does need to keep in mind that the names refer to a kind of box memory that can hold data. 
even if the programmer doesn't name, doesn't have to know where in memory that box is located. In Java, and in many other programming languages, a variable has a type that indicates what sort of data it can hold. One type of variable might hold integers to hold numbers such as 3, 3, negative 7, and 0. While another holds floating point numbers, numbers with decimal points such as 3.14 or 3.14, probably that's the first three of pi, 3.14, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, Yes, the computer does make a distinction between the integer 17 and the floating point number 17.0. They actually look quite different inside of the computer. There can also be types of individual characters such as a, a semicolon, and so on. And strings, hello, and a string can include many characters and so on. And less common types such as dates, colors, sounds, or any other kind of data that the pro a program might need to store. Programming language always have commands for getting data into and out of variables and for doing computation with data. For example, the following assignment statement, which might appear in a Java program, tells the computer to take the number stored in the variable name principal and multiply that number by 0.07 and then store the result in the variable name interest. Interest equals principal times 0.07. As an example, there are also input commands for getting data from the user or from files on the computer's disk, and output commands for sending the data in the other direction. These basic commands for moving data from place to place and other performing computation are the building blocks for the programs. These building blocks are combined into complex programs using control statement uh, structures and subroutines. A program is a sequence of instructions, and the ordinary flow of control, the computer executes the instructions and the sequence of which they appear, one after the other. However, this is obviously very limited. The computer would soon run out of instructions to execute. Control structures are special instructions that can change the flow of control. There are two basic basic types of control structure. Uh, loops, which allow a sequence of instructions to be repeated over and over, and branches, which allow the computer to decide between two or more different courses of action by testing the conditions that occur as the program is running. For example, it might be that if a value principle is greater than 10,000, then the interest should be computed by multiplying the principle by 0 0.05. If not, then the interest should be computed by multiplying the principle by 0 0.04. A program needs some way of expressing this type of decision. In Java, it could be expressed using the following if statement. If, and then in uh, parentheses, principle is greater than 10,000 in parentheses, then underneath that is interest equals principal times 0 0.05. Then underneath that, else, and underneath that, interest equals principal times 0 0.04. Don't worry about the details for now. Just remember that the computer can test the condition and decide what to do next on the basis of the test. Loops are used when the same task has to be performed more than once. For example, if you want to print out a mailing label for each time, yeah, so each name on the mailing list, you might say, get the first name and address and print the label. Get the second name and address and print the label. Get the third name and address and print the label. Because this quickly becomes ridiculous and might not work if you don't know how in advance. It might not work at all if you don't know how in advance and in advance how many times there are. Uh, what would you like to say? Something like, while there are more names to process, get the name and the address and print the label. A loop can be used as in a program to express such repetition. Large programs are so complex that it would be almost impossible to write them if there were not some way to break them up into manageable chunks. Subroutines provide one way to do this. A subroutine consists of instructions for performing some tasks grouped together as a unit and given a name. That name can then be used as a substitute for the whole set of instructions. For example, 
Suppose that one of the tasks that your program needs to perform a subroutine to give the subroutine some appropriate name, say, draw house. Then, any place in your program you need a draw house, you can just do this with a simple command, draw house. This will have the same effect as repeating all of the house drawing instructions in place. The advantage here is not just that you are saved, that you save typing. Organizing your program into subroutines also helps you organize your thinking and your programs in an effort. While writing the house drawing subroutine, you can concentrate on the problem of drawing a house without worrying for the moment about the rest of the program. And once a subroutine is written, you can forget all about the details of drawing houses that the problem that problem is solved since you have a subroutine to do it for you. A subroutine becomes just like a built-in part of the language which you can use without thinking about the details of what goes on inside the subroutine. Variables, tides, loops, branches, and subroutines are the basis of what might be called traditional programming. However, as programmers become larger, additional structures needed to help deal with their complexity. One of the most effective tools is that has been found is object-oriented programming language, which will be discuss discussed in the next section. Uh, if you know, this helped you save actually reading it. Uh, give this video a like if it didn't, or you know, yeah, give it this like. If you want to see uh, hear you know the more from this book, uh, give, please subscribe. Uh, thank you and have a good day or night or whatever time it is. Most importantly, though, have fun. Thank you and well.